Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. I'm proposing you today to focus on floating offshore wind. This technology has a major role to play in the energy transition, as it has the power to transform sea areas that are inaccessible for fixed offshore today and make them suitable for wind generation. Offshore wind permits the deployment of large scale projects and gigawatt additions of renewable energy. And we need to go fast uh, if we want um, to go towards a 1.5 or 2 degree scenario. So offshore wind and floating offshore wind uh, have a key role to play. Um, offshore wind also permits to capture high wind resources compared to onshore wind and to reach high capacity factors around 50%. Floating offshore wind reinforces the advantages of fixed offshore because the first project points to an even higher capacity factor than fixed offshore, and the technology permits to access the best wind resources without the constraints of water deepness. There are, however, a number of challenges ahead for floating offshore developers. The main one is going to be to lower the LCOE of the floating offshore wind farms, uh, because this LCOE today is around or above um, 150 euro per megawatt hour, which is to a large extent similar to the first uh, fixed offshore wind farms 10 years back, um, and which is uh, to a large extent due to the limited size of the projects that have been built and financed to date. None of them exceeds uh, 50 megawatts. The development of large scale projects and the establishment of the supply chain will allow the LCOE of floating offshore wind to fall down quickly and ultimately compete with fixed offshore. Innovation, large scale development will be key to see the LCOE fall, but also um, the cost of capital and thus for many projects, the capacity to raise a significant quantum of non recourse debt is going to be key um, to lower the LCOE. In this presentation, I propose to give you uh, some market insight on the bankability of floating offshore projects. So, Sorry, I'm struggling to. Yeah, here we are. So, who we are, analysis. Um, we're in the top 10 um, monitored lead arranger in infrastructure generally um, and also in renewable. We also tend to focus on the more difficult projects, and we, we are first mover, educating also the number of debt funds that invest through us and bring them. Um, to finance more, I would say, uh, cha more challenging or, or new asset classes. We were a first mover in fixed offshore. We started to finance project in um, 2011 in Germany, what were quite challenging projects at the time, and very few bonds uh, were sophisticated, sophisticated enough um, to provide non recourse debt at the time. Um, and we've also financed uh, fixed offshore in new geographies like Taiwan. Um, and um, most recently, uh, we closed yesterday a transaction in the US. Uh, we also want to be a first mover in the financing of floating offshore wind. We are one of the lender and the sole green coordinator of the wind float, uh, sorry, of the Kinkerdine project. Um, of the King Curly project in the UK and uh, working on closing uh, the debt for one of the French pilot projects uh, this year. So, very quickly, on the potential of floating offshore wind, uh, we expect uh, close to 4 gigawatt to be deployed by uh, 2030. Um, the areas on the map show you where there is a potential, and this is where the seabed is relatively deep near shore, um, and where fixed offshore is not a possible solution. 
So this is uh, France, Portugal, Scotland, uh, Korea, Japan, the eastern coast of the US. Um, so where where is the floating offshore wind at the moment? So there are two, um, or even three now, um, because uh, King Curtin is, is just started to be operational or is, is, is being commissioned. So there are three pilot wind farms commissioned. High Wind Scotland, uh, 2017 and um, wind float in Portugal in 2020 and now uh, in 2021 uh, Kikodine. Um, so the, the first the, the farms are being deployed uh, where the water are too deep for the fixed solutions um, and so at the moment there are 100 megawatts that are connected and the next stage uh, will be fully commercial project of 250 megawatts. This is being auctioned. The auction has just started in France for the south of Brittany. And ultimately, um, the, our opinion is that uh, floating offshore is going to compete with fixed offshore. So just a focus on the Kinkerdite project, uh, to which we are uh, the sole green coordinator of the debt. Um, this project was certified, uh, received a certified climate bond label by the Climate Bond Initiative. Um, so the, the use of the proceeds uh, have been identified, but there were also uh, ESG rating by Vigeo. Uh, certifying the, the, the green aspects of the project. So the project is uh, in Scotland, the second project in Scotland after high wind. It is located 15 kilometers southeast of Aberdeen in water depths ranging of 60 to 80 meters. It has one 2 megawatt turbine and five 9.5 megawatt Vestas turbines. So it is a, a full scale project. The foundation are wind float foundation provided by principal power. And um, the project is going to be fully operational in the coming months. The debt quantum was 380 million, um, was closed in 2020, and the project plans to be operational for 25 years. So the, the industry is in the early days, but it is moving towards fully non-recourse finance. Um, to understand where it is, it's pretty useful to look at how the first fixed offshore, pro offshore project were financed 10 years ago. So at that time, there were only a few banks, maybe seven, that were very specialized and sophisticated enough to finance the very first project in, in Germany and Belgium. And also multi-tranching was used uh, using EIB, ECA cover, and the limit, limited amount of commercial cover. So this has helped the financing of the first projects. If you think at where fixed offshore is now, 10 years later, and we contributed to this, um, there are now 120 different debt providers involved in the financing of fixed offshore. Um, we, at Natixis, we have a debt platform and uh, we attract an origi originate transaction um, for debt funds. So we, we participated to the education of these funds towards the fixed offshore market. There has been also now yeah, a diversification of the debt provider for fixed offshore. We are seeing now debt funds, international banks and uh, Asian ones, and there is very strong liquidity. That's, has helped improving the funding costs for fixed offshore. So it will take a few years for floating offshore to reach that stage. The, the stage we are at now is um, to see the first closing of fully non recourse debt. Um, there has been a funding by the EIB of the Wind Float Atlantic project uh, in Portugal. Um, but fully non-recourse commercial debt, uh, we're probably going to see with the first, the four French pilot projects that are uh, between 24 and 30 megawatts. In 2022, there should be precedence of non-recourse commercial debt that for the 
floating offshore pilot project in France. And this is going to help the financing of the full-scale commercial project that will follow on. Yesterday, the French Ecological Transition Ministry announced that there are 10 company consortiums that have been selected for the Bretagne Sud floating offshore auction. So we're going to see uh, bids for 250 megawatt floating offshore wind farm. And then um, another auction for 500 megawatt is going to follow on. And um, the award is going to be in uh, 2022, uh, but COD is not going to happen before 2029. Um, a word on COVID impact. Um, it's quite interesting to see that the renewable sector has proved to be very resilient, uh, both equity and debt, actually. The, the, the performance of listed renewable player uh, during the COVID crisis uh, uh, has been very good co compared to other type of companies. And so this sector attracts a lot of equity and debt. On top of this, now there is the EU Green Deal. Um, and this is only to reinforce the attractiveness of this asset class. So this is good news for uh, floating offshore developers. Um, now, um, in this table, I'm trying to list the, the risk of a floating offshore wind farm and compare them um, with a fixed offshore wind farm. So if you think about the turbine supply, um, the, the same turbine are used for floating and fixed offshore. There is only a reinforcement of the mass and the risk, the, the contract are of similar type and the risk is similar. Um, the floater, um, they are newer concept. Some have been uh, tested with a uh, very small, um, smaller scale uh, developments or tested in, in labo laboratory. Um, but um, you can assemble in many cases for many floaters, it's possible to assemble the floater and the turbines in the port and then to tow them to site. Um, Anchorage um, is, the, is the next step, but um, it's not significantly challenging because uh, uh, it's using concept uh, from the oil and gas industry. And um, because there is the assembly in the port, there is a lower exposure to weather downtime. So for that reason, um, the risk of floating is maybe slightly lower than for fixed. Inter-array cable, there are proven technology in the oil and gas sector, so we, we don't feel um, there are significant challenge. And then where there is a challenge is for the substation and export cable, where the technology is not fully proven. Uh, but the first pilot project in France uh, have gone around uh, that difficulty in their design because the substation is onshore. So again, this project uh, have a lower risk on this aspect than fixed offshore. Regarding the interface risk, uh, well, there is no established supply chain for the floaters. That's one thing. And um, but then the, the contractual structure is is similar to what we are seeing uh, for fixed offshore, but maybe yeah, the risk is slightly higher because the, of the lack of an established supply chain. Um, contractor insolvency, it's a similar risk to, to the smaller companies that have designed the floater, have teamed up with a larger company with a good credit standing um, that have EPC uh, capacity. So overall, um, the risk is, is similar or slightly lower pre-completion to fixed offshore. Then um, post-completion, so you have the resource risk, but the, the, the way to assess the wind resource is similar for both technology, fixed and floating. Then the technology risks, and that's the main issue with floating, is that um, the power curve of the turbine it's going to be warranted only for a certain behavior of the floater. And um, if there are 
motions, for example, that are outside of the specification of the turbine supplier, then uh, you can the, the warranty will not be valid. So this is where you have the main issue during the operating phase, and this needs uh, this needs to be mitigated by a, a long-term O&M contract, um, provided uh, if, if it can be provided by the, the, the provider of the floater. Um, yeah, the, this is quite necessary. And um, then again, another risk is contractor or insolvency, but then you, you have to look at each specific project, but uh, there is no specificity in terms of floating offshore. So, Overall, the project performance from risk is higher for floating offshore wind farm, but um, this can be mitigated by a strong O&M contractual package, more cons conservative debt sizing, and uh, it will attract a higher risk premium. Very quickly. Um, so you, you have here a highlight uh, of the main terms we are expecting for the first floating offshore wind farms and um, the, the terms are going to be very similar to the fixed uh, the first fixed offshore wind farm 10 years back so you have a compared to fixed offshore now that would be a shorter shorter maturity of the debt maybe 14 to 18 years uh, relatively strong contractual structure uh, for the construction but you, you can have a multi-package uh, EPCI the sources of debt, we're probably going to see ECA and uh, EIB tranches. Then the gearing can be 50-50 to H20. The, the real sizing parameter is going to be the debt service coverage ratio. And uh, this is um, going typically to be around 135 on the P90 profile. Then regarding margin premium, and this is where I, I go to the attractiveness of the sector, where many financial institutions are willing um, to finance uh, renewable projects. The, the premium is probably going to be lower than what was experienced for the fixed uh, offshore wind on the, the premium for fixed offshore versus um, onshore. So, at that time, the premium experience was 50 to 150 base points, and we're probably going to see a lower premium than this. But thank you for your attention. I hope you found this presentation useful, and uh, do not hesitate to contact me on LinkedIn uh, should you want to hear any more. <laughs>